In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance Family Conversation. And as always, it's great to be with all of you. Top of the morning. So let's uh, start off our conversation by inviting Mary to be with us. Mary has many titles. Mary is uh, known as the Mother of God. Mary is the mother of the church. And Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. Mary is the mother of God. Mary is the mother of the church. And Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. Also, we cry out to Mary as our life, our sweetness, and our hope. Our life, our sweetness, and our hope. In the Hail Holy Queen. So let's uh, let's pray to Mary and ask her to give us the grace to get to know and love Christ more and more each day. As we pray, the prayer that she loves most, and is the Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And bless the fruit of thy Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Now let's turn to our spiritual director, who is the Holy Spirit, and ask him to help us. To help us. The Holy Spirit is known as the paraclete, He's also known as the gift of gifts. Holy Spirit is also known as the sweet guest of our soul. Holy Spirit is also our consoler. He's our counselor too. And the Holy Spirit also is known as our interior master St. Paul reminds us with these encouraging words from Roma, Romans chapter 8 we do not know how to pray as we ought but the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans so that we can say Abba which means daddy or father. Abba. So let's turn to the Holy Spirit and beg the Holy Spirit, who is our spiritual director, thanks be to God, that he will give us a lot of light in our intellect, as well as the fire of divine love to burn within our hearts. Light in our intellect, the fire of divine love to burn within our hearts. As we pray the traditional prayer to the Holy Spirit. And that is, come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. Thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful, by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us that by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. 
Saint Joseph, pray for us. Saint Michael the Archangel, pray for us. Saint Gabriel, pray for us. Saint Raphael, pray for us. Saint Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. Saint Teresa of Avila, pray for us. Saint Maria Faustina, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So my friends, the family that prays together stays together, how true. Today, as always, I'd like to encourage you by offering prayers for all of you. And the prayers that I'd like to offer is the prayer of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Dave, what a blessing it is for us to have the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. What a blessing. What a blessing it is to have the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. It's by far the greatest of all prayers. By far the greatest of all prayers is the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. So I'd like to place you on the altar in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass and offer the following intentions. First, I'd like to pray that all of us today, as a family united in the Holy Spirit, that we would be open to the inspirations of the Holy Spirit. That's right. That we would be open to the inspirations of the Holy Spirit. Perhaps we can pray this short but powerful prayer, if said with faith. That is, come Holy Spirit, come. Come Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. Come Holy Spirit, come. Come Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. My second intention I'd like to pray for all of your families, especially for your loved ones that have walked away from the church. They no longer go to Mass, they no longer go to confession, they've been maybe angry or disgruntled against something within the church, but it's really their own hearts that have to be changed. They have to allow their hearts to be changed. Often it's not so much the church, but some interior moral problem that the individual does not want to relinquish or give up. So I'd like to place uh, many of the young adults on the altar that they would recognize that true happiness can only come from God. And my third intention, I'd like to pray for all of those, I'd like to pray for all of those who will be dying today. That's right, all of those who will be dying today will be passing from time to eternity to be judged by Christ. 
I'd like to pray especially for those who are perhaps not in not in the state of grace. That they would beg for God's mercy. That they would beg for God's mercy. God's mercy is his greatest attribute. So those intentions I'd like to play place on the altar. Lisa Cano has also suggested we pray for the upcoming pro-life march in LA this Saturday in Washington, D.C. I think, I think they're going to be doing it on Friday, so that's right. Make sure that we keep that in our prayers because we're calling to mind the 50th year that Roe vs. Wade was proclaimed and uh, that was uh, January 22nd 1973 it'll be 50 years in just a few days so we want to make sure that we we offer our prayers of reparation and prevention because even though Roe vs. Wade has been overturned it's still we still have a lot of work to do because now it depends upon the states and in our country it's about 50 it's about 50 50 it's about 50 50 About 25 of the states uh, prohibit abortion, thanks be to God, but another 25 states allow for it. Allow for it. So fine, my friends, uh, I'd like to start off as has been our custom. Very briefly, I'd like to just summarize the content of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. I, here I have my Spanish version in hand. I'm just going to make a brief summary of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, then we can enter into the riches of the Word of God. Catechism of the Catholic Church Catechism of the Catholic Church was published in the early 90s uh, by John Paul II with the help of Cardinal Ratzinger, who was Benedict the 16th. In all of all the literary works of John Paul II, there are many encyclicals, apostolic exhortations, apostolic letters. General audience catechesis. John Paul II was a prolific writer and missionary. Perhaps the greatest of the the works of John Paul II was this, which Father Mike Schmitz is going through during the course of this year, and. Um, Any good catechism has to have four pillars, four foundational elements, which some of you were catechists or possibly still catechists. I think some of you are still engaged in, in catechesis. The four basic pillars of a good catechesis, and this you have in this Catechism, Catechism of the Catholic Church, which is the second universal catechism in 2,000 years. The first universal catechism was the Catechism of the Council of Trent, which was published in the, came out in the 1500s as a response to the Protestant Reformation, and that was part of what is called the, the Counter Reform. 
that the Pope called the Council in Southern Italy in Trent, and after quite a few sessions and quarreling and de debates this and that, and Charles Borromeo had to bring them back together after they were separated, finally the Catechism of Trent became the foundational doctrinal uh, in teaching of the Catholic Church 500 years ago. So, getting back to what I was mentioning, the Catechism of the Catholic Church has four basic pillars. So the four, four pillars. And this is worthy of of memorizing. Okay, so the first would be that of the dogma. And the dogma specifically would be that of the creed. The dogma would that be that of the creed. Now what I say is easier for you to understand is when you go to Mass on Sunday, or a solemnity, after the priest or deacon delivers the homily, then, then what happens is we get we, we, we rise to our feet and we, we profess our faith. That's called the creed, or credo, which means I believe. And that creed the Catechism takes and explains in minute detail who God is, who is the Father, who is the Son, who is the Holy Spirit, the communion of saints, all those different details is explained in the Creed. So the first would be that of the Creed. The second would be that of the that of the sacraments. So we've got the creed and then we have that of the sacraments, the channels of grace. The seven sacraments that Jesus that Jesus uh, instituted for our sanctification. The third would be that of the morality. Most specifically, the Ten, the ten Commandments. So this would be the third, morality or the Ten Commandments. My friends, we're giving a brief catechesis on the Catechism of the Catholic Church and its basic content. The moral structure has the Ten Commandments, but other things too. It has the Eight Beatitudes, it has the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity, and goes through the moral or cardinal virtues of justice, temperance, prudence, and fortitude, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So that would be the, the part on morality. And then the fourth would be that of prayer. Now, you people who are seriously considering growing in your growing in your prayer life, you're seriously considering growing in your prayer life, and many many of you are. I cannot recommend more highly the reading of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, but most specifically related to prayer would be the fourth part on prayer. And uh, it, it indeed is a, it indeed, it, it's a spiritual masterpiece. Of all the writings on prayer, and I've read books on prayer, 
as the summary of prayer in general, I think it's the best I've ever I've ever read. Uh, so, just uh, just uh, giving you a summary of the teachings of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Here are the four pillars. First would be the dogmatic part on the creed, the profession of faith, then the, then the catechism explains in detail the seven sacraments, and the catechism explains morality, human actions, and that would be basically go through the Ten Commandments, and then last we have the treatise on prayer. So I've given you for catechetical moment today a brief summary of the content of the greatest work of John Paul II, one of the greatest works of the Church, and that is the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So, it's interesting that when this did come out in the early 90s, we had a community discernment and I was here with Father Father Larry's been our pastor for many years. Father Larry's been our pastor for many years. And then Father Larry's been our pastor for many years. Father Al Hall was with us. What we did was we actually took the Catechism of the Catholic Church and we made photocopies for the people. What we did was we, we explained the Catechism of the Catholic Church. I think it took about a year. We made a photocopy of about 10 numbers every Mass and we preached. That was, what, that was the content of our preaching the whole year. So that was... Uh, that would have been in the 90s. It would have been in the 90s. So, for us to be able to transmit our faith to others, we have to get to know our faith. We have to get to know our faith if we want to transmit our faith to others. You can't give what you don't have. So, Today in the today in the readings I'll give you a bird's eye view of the readings and let's delve into the reading. I'll pull out a couple of ideas for our meditation. As mentioned earlier, we're reading we are reading in meditating upon first reading is taken from the letter to the Hebrews and this is a very priestly priestly reading you really want to get to know the whole biblical dimension of a priest this is one of the best letters in the whole Bible speaking about the priesthood of the Old Testament, Jesus Christ as the high priest, the definition of who a priest is, the role of the priest, the function of the priest, the importance of the priest and the priesthood, for example, yesterday we had the idea of Melchizedek is related to Abraham as a symbol of Jesus Christ, the eternal high priest. Bread and wine offered by Melchizedek, we pray in the first Eucharistic prayer. So we'll, we'll give you an idea or two from the letter to the Hebrews. We've arrived already at chapter 7. Then the response real psalm is taken from Psalm 40. The antiphon is, 
Here am I, Lord. I come to do your will. Beautiful prayer. You might even be repeating that prayer today with a prayer to the Holy Spirit. Here, here am I, Lord. Here am I, Lord. I come to do your will. What a short but beautiful prayer. It is. It's a short but beautiful prayer. So now we've arrived at the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3. Chapter 3 of chap, uh, chapter 3 of Mark. And in this what we see it's it's a it's a, it's a relatively short passage but very telling as to what's happening in the public life of our Lord. In a summary of this is basically the, this idea. Our Lord is in his public life which lasts about three years from when he's 30 to 33. It just lasts those three short years, but there was never a man that changed the world so radically as our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But what's happening is so many people are seeking him out. From Galilee, from Judea, and from other parts. From Jerusalem, such that Jesus asked the apostles to get a boat because he's afraid of being crushed by the people. There's so many people that are hemming him in and he's healing them in huge numbers that they want to touch him. Maybe if you've seen the chosen one of the episodes in the second season, you have the apostles waiting for Jesus, and you have a long line of people that are waiting to meet Jesus individually. And after the Lord has been with them the whole day, Ima, which means his mother, has been waiting for him, he comes to where the apostles are. He's literally exhausted, goes into a tent, and sits down and his mother, Emma, Mary, he wash, she washes his feet. That scene in Chosen is basically what we have today. Jesus is being hemmed in by so many people that, that love him, but also they want him to, to heal him. They want him to heal just by touching. So there we have, my friends, a kind of a summary of the readings for today. So let's uh, return to the letter of the Hebrews. which talks about the priesthood. And we should never forget that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is the high priest. Jesus Christ is the high priest and the model for all, for all priests. He's the high priest. So Hebrews 
starts off by saying, Jesus is always able to save those who approach God through him. Since he lives forever to make intercession for them. So Jesus Christ, he, he is the high priest. He is the high priest. It says he's able, he's able to save those who approach the eternal father through him. He's able to save us. So let's stop and, and speak a little bit about that word save. Jesus is the high priest. The name that was given to him by the angel to Mary was Jesus. Then the archangel Gabriel says, because he, because he will save the people, he will save the people of their sins. So his name is actually his purpose and his function. He is ready to save those who approach him with trust. Let's turn his name and the meaning of his name into, into a prayer for ourselves by means of a biblical, another biblical example. I'm sure you remember in the gospel where Jesus is preaching the word of God. Preaching the word of God. And Jesus, as the sun goes down, he tells the apostles to get in the boat and to cross over to the other side of the lake. And he stays on the shore. He has to compel them to get in the boat because they didn't want to get in the boat. They're probably tired and cold and hungry and they just wanted to stay on the shore and maybe make a fire and have some, some meal that night. But the Lord says they get in the boat and he's... praying on the mountain. Now the apostles are in the boat and the waters are tough, and there, in the dark of the night, they see someone walking on the water. And they think it's a ghost. They think it's a ghost. They cry out, and Lord, the Lord says, do not be afraid, it is I. Peter says this, if it is you, Lord, tell me to come out of the boat. Jesus says, come. And Peter lifts his foot and he starts to walk on the water, but possibly aware of a huge wave that's about to engulf him, he starts to sink in the waves. Now what he's going to say now, say now is what I'm trying to expound upon the name of Jesus. He says, Lord, Lord, save me. Jesus with one hand, man a little faith, why do you doubt? Jesus stretches out his hand grabs the hand of Peter, then Peter is able to walk on the water, they get in the boat, and they cross over to the other side of the lake. But I'd like to highlight is that Peter cried out, save me. Save me. So my friends, 
the first reading says Jesus is always able to save those who approach God through him. We should never be afraid to call out to the Lord, Lord, save me. It's a beautiful prayer. If Peter said it, so can we. Lord, Lord, save me. Many moments in our life when, we go, when, when we're going through tough times. For example, we have maybe, maybe we have a health issue. Lord, save me. Perhaps a family member has bad medical news. Lord, save me. Maybe one of our children is lost. Lord, save me. Maybe our children have walked away from the faith. Lord, save me, save them. Perhaps, perhaps we're struggling to be able to pay the bills. Lord, save me. Perhaps we're struggling with a family member. It just doesn't seem to work. We don't seem to be able to get along well with a family member. Lord, save me. Perhaps at work, someone is, is causing you a lot of headaches. Maybe you're being persecuted because of your Catholic faith. Lord, save me. Maybe you're having doubts about your Catholic faith. Lord, save me. Perhaps a loved one of yours has passed away. Your mother, your father, your uncle, your aunt, a good friend, was taken from this life to the next. And they, you're really struggling with that. Lord, save me. Jesus is there to save us. And then the book of Hebrews, letter of the Hebrews, describes what type of priest Jesus is. In these words, he's such a high priest, he's holy. He's holy. And the closer we get to Christ, we talk to him, we contemplate his life, we think about him, then we become more and more like him, that we become holy. Jesus actually said, be holy holy as your heavenly father is holy. He's holy, he's innocent. Perhaps we're not always innocent, but the beauty of the Catholic faith is every time we have recourse to God through the sacrament of confession, then our innocence is restored. Our innocence is restored through sacramental confession. What a blessing it is to be a Catholic. He's undefiled. We can say the same thing, that through sacramental confession, we who are defiled by sin, we become undefiled.
So those are some ideas on Jesus as the high priest. Jesus is the high priest. Now what about what about our own Catholic priesthood? As you're going through this letter, I invite all of you to pray. Pray for priests. And pray for future priests because the harvest is rich. The harvest is rich, but the laborers are few. I invite all of you to pray that we get more priests and holy priests at that. That we get more priests but holy priests. You know, Pope Ben of the Sixteenth of Happy Memory, during his pontificate, which lasted about seven to eight years. He actually, Pope Ben the Sixteen, actually called the year of the priesthood. Maybe you remember. In the year of the priesthood, he actually took a priest as a patron and model for other priests. And the name of that priest was St. John Maria Vianney. That's right, St. John Maria Vianney. We also know, know him as the Curie of Ars, who spent on a daily basis close to 13, 14, 15 hours in the confessional every day for close to 40 years. At the end of his life, the devil appeared, really angry at him because he had stolen, he had stolen so many souls from the devil devil said there are five more priests like him that his king five more priests like him that his than his kingdom would be destroyed five more priests like him that his kingdom will be destroyed so let's pray that we get more priests jesus says the harvest is rich the harvest is rich, but the laborers are few. Beg the Lord of the harvest to send more workers in the vineyard. That's right. The harvest is rich, but the laborers are few. So beg the Lord of the harvest to send more. Five holy priests like the cure of ours and the kingdom of the devil would be destroyed. So those are a few ideas on the first reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Psalm 40, the responsorial psalm, the antiphon is, Here am I, Lord, I come to do your will. My friends, my friends, our sanctification, our holiness depends 
on one thing. It's discerning and doing the will of God. Our sanctification depends on one thing and it's doing the will of God. This is how the way what well, the way Colby presented it. Maximilian Colby. A capital W, small del W. The capital W would be God. The small W would be us. So St. Maximilian Colby said that our sanctification depends upon aligning our will with the with the will of God. So it's aligning our will with the will of God. That's that's the secret of holiness. So we already have Marie, as well as Sophie, we're praying the Novena for the priesthood. Please join us. Yesterday, in my catechetical teaching, I did speak about the, the whole idea of making Novenas, that I would make a Novena for the newly married couple, as well as I would do Novenas. I do Novenas when I'm doing a funeral mass for the deceased and the relatives. But that's very pleasing to, to offer a novena for, for the priesthood because you people, if I can use this terminology, you're at the mercy of the priests. If you have a holy, faithful, zealous priest, then you'll benefit from that. You'll definitely benefit from that. And of course, Jesus Christ is our high priest. That takes us to the gospel for today. The gospel really, it's, it's, it's fascinating in the sense that we see Jesus withdrawn to the sea with his disciples. What we have is there's there there are huge huge numbers of people multitudes of people that are following our Lord. We'll come across the passage where Jesus is preaching in the wilderness and there are 5000 people without counting the women and the children. So say, for example, you got the husband, the wife, and, and four children, you're going to have whew, like 20,000 people. Huge numbers of people that were following our Lord. Not only did he heal them, but he spent time teaching them. He said, because they're like sheep without the shepherd. They're like sheep without a shepherd. So, so many people are coming to him. That he told his disciple to get a boat ready for him because of the crowd, so that they would not crush him. We see in another circumstance that Peter, James, and John, they have disembarked, they're washing their nets, and our Lord is preaching then from the seashore. And he tells Peter to get in the boat, and from the boat, Jesus is actually preaching the word of God because he's hemmed in by so many people that he can barely move. And one of the reasons why is that 
They are captivated by his preaching and teaching, but also because he cured many. That's right, he cured many. One of the titles that we give to Christ is that he is the he is the Savior, as we mentioned in the letter to the Hebrews. Jesus means Savior, but also Jesus is the physician, the doctor, the divine physician. He would heal people by touching them. Sometimes heal people simply by the word. Remember the centurion's servant, Jesus says that his servant will be healed because the centurion has faith. And when the centurion arrives at the house, his servant is already healed. He's already healed. Now, we see Jesus healing many, many people in the gospel today. We mentioned the the movie episode of Chosen Jesus healing many, many people. What about us? Jesus is the divine physician. And it's and it's interesting that that even though Jesus has ascended in heaven and he sits at the right hand of God the Father, from thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. But Christ is still active in the world, especially through the church and the sacraments. Let me tell you an important place of healing is Our Lady of Lourdes. Maybe have any of have any of you ever gone to France to Lourdes, Our Lady of Lourdes, France? Have you ever been there? I, I went there once. And it's one of the places where there are most healings, as well as St. Anne de Beaupre in Canada, if you've ever been there. But Lourdes... France, there are many healings, even to this day. Probably what you're thinking about is, yes, Father, because when Bernadette dug in the ground, the water sprung forth from the ground, and it's been flowing ever since the year 1858, when Our Lady appeared to Bernadette. True. You have the miraculous waters of Lourdes. But there's another place, another time, in which there are even more abundant healings, and I'll tell you. If you've ever been at Lourdes and you spent the day there, the evening there, maybe you remember, there at dusk, when the sun is going down, you have the seat. You have the sick people often in the in the open plaza or piazza, and the priest takes the the priest takes the monstrance with the blessed sacrament, and he goes through the crowd. And what he does is he, with the Blessed Sacrament, he makes a Eucharistic Marian procession outside the church. And he blesses the people with the monstrance, the Eucharistic presence. That is where, my friends, that actually, my friends, is where you have most healings. It's at dusk during the Eucharistic procession 
when the priest carrying the monstrance is blessing the people and it's the same Jesus Christ that healed the people 2,000 years ago that we're talking about today. It's the same Jesus Christ, the divine physician, who healed these ailing people. It's the same Lord that is healing the sick even to this day. Never forget, the healing of the body is important. But the healing of the soul is even more important. So my friends, I invite you to share our message with your friends so that we would grow in, in, in quantity as well as in quality in our persevering family. And I'd like to impart to you all my priestly blessing, inviting you to, to make your Novena for the priests. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.